Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening and I'll speak on the topic of how the knowledge of karma can arm us in our life. Arm means provide arms, weapons for us in life. Uh, fortnight ago, I was in America and I was at one city. So there I met a young Indian boy who had joined the American army. And he told me one of the first lessons that they taught us was that in a war, no matter what happens, never drop your arms. You have a gun, you have a knife, whatever it is, that is the source of your safety and your strength. So no matter how much your enemy intimidates you, don't drop your weapons. Because as soon as you drop your weapon, you become powerless. So similarly for us, life is a journey, but life is also sometimes like a war. And in this war, spiritual knowledge is like our weapon. Tasma da jnana sambhutam rutstham jnana sinatmanaha chitvainam samishayam yogam Bharata. Krishna tells Arjuna in 442 in the Bhagavad Gita, Therefore Arjuna, arise and fight. Although Arjuna is in a battlefield, and, and that battlefield obviously will require physical weapons. Arjuna is an archer, so he will need bow and arrow to fight. But here Krishna is telling Arjuna, you have to first fight the inner war. Arjuna had become confused about what to do. And to fight this inner war, the weapon that you need is Tasmat Ajnana Sambhutam Ritstham Jnana Sinatmanaha Knowledge is your sword. Knowledge is your weapon. So with the weapon of knowledge, arise. Atishto Tishta Bharata Arise and fight. So similarly for us, without knowledge, we become weaponless. Now we become basically no better than animals. If humanity has risen above the animals in any way, that is primarily because of knowledge. So, now there can be very many different kinds of knowledge, but Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Adhyatma Vidya Vidyanam Among various kinds of knowledge, I am spiritual knowledge. So today we will talk about the knowledge of karma and how that can be like a weapon, how that can be like our, how it can arm us. So I'll talk about this in three parts. I'll use the same acronym ARM, A-R-M, to understand the principles of karma and how they can empower us in our life. So A is assumption. Assumption means that all of us, whenever we live life, we implicitly assume that there is a cause-effect correlation in whatever happens in life. Say so suppose one day you are waiting, for your child comes back home and your child has a, you know, a black eye and a broken nose. Say, what happened? Say, no, no, just my eye turned black and my nose broke. It happened by chance. What? No, what happened? Did you get into a fight with someone? Was there a bully who beat you up? What happened? Whenever we see an effect, we immediately assume there is a cause. So without this assumption of cause-effect correlation, we will just not be able to function in life. So whenever we see an effect, we assume there must be a cause. And not only does our <coughs> our day to day function is day to day functioning is based on this but also scientific advancement is based on this whenever science sees any notes any observation at that time they try to understand why is it happening like this so when newton saw the fruit falling from which he postulated the theory of gravity now when he saw the fruit falling, he asked the question, what made this fruit fall? Now the, the, this question itself presumes, assumes that things don't happen by chance. 
that there is some kind of cause effect connection and therefore okay this fruit fall is apple falling is the cause is the effect what is the cause so nobody lives their life as if there is no cause effect connection in the world even if somebody is a materialist somebody is an atheist somebody is a nihilist who doesn't believe in any kind of tradition but even they they accept cause effect connection and when the cause effect connection doesn't work they get angry somebody might not believe in anything but if they go to a five star hotel and pay for a good meal and then the meal that they get is pathetic so what kind of customer service is this says oh, what's wrong so i paid so much money so the cause is there i paid the money so the effect has to come good quality food should come so even if somebody doesn't believe in god nobody raises their children saying as if actually no whatever you do life is chaotic so whether you make your bed or not life is going to stink whether you study or not life is all life is all disorderly now what you do doesn't matter nobody lives like that so there is a implicit assumption both in our day to day activities as well as in science that there is a cause effect <coughs> connection now the principle of karma is simply the extension of this implicit cause effect connection to the domain of consciousness and conscious choices conscious actions so when principle of karma essentially means that to every action that we do there is a reaction so <clears throat> now the problem here is that at one level karma makes sense we all believe that yes things should think that if there's action if there's a cause there should be effect there should be act there's action there's a reaction there should be a reaction and though karma makes sense at one level the problem is that sometimes observations don't match sometimes we see good people do bad things or rather uh, good people get bad things happening to them this is what is called as the problem of evil why do bad things happen to good people and this is one of the one atheists consider this to be one of the strongest arguments against the idea of a god governing the world or any kind of car like principle of karma now yeah it's it's a serious problem that why do bad things happen to good people but if an atheist asks this question we could turn the question around and ask why should bad things not happen to good people what do you mean you know if you do good you should get good if you do good you should not get bad well who said so if everything is just the whole of universe is nothing but fundamental particles governed by impersonal laws then why should there be good action leading to good results and bad action leading to bad results when you ask why are bad things happen to good people good people you are assuming that there is some kind of cosmic correlation by which our actions and results are correlated but atheism has no reason to justify this correlation within an atheistic world view there is no reason why good actions should lead to good results and bad actions should lead to bad results because everything happens by just random interactions of particles which don't even sense what is good or what is bad when an apple falls from the say not an apple you have a big coconut falls from a tree then the coconut may fall on the head of someone and may crack the person's head but the coconut is not thinking i am doing good or bad the coconut is simply falling isn't it i was in florida and there i saw on the streets hundreds of coconuts all lying on the streets said, what happened he said the government in order to protect all the citizens it had decided the coconut may fall any time from or from the ground it may somebody may hit somebody's head but the government had cut all the coconuts and they had actually employed a person to cut all the coconuts and but then why are they lying here then then can't they can't you take them to can't they take them to sell it he said no they cut them before they became ripe enough 
and then what they, they have to take it and they have to preserve it and if they have to employ labor to preserve it market it the labor laws are so complex that actually importing coconuts from mexico is cheaper than marketing those coconuts so this coconut is just lying over there anybody can pick up those as many coconuts as you want and they can take it so the, the way i am giving this example is that when coconut falls in the ground we could say that it is just if we don't believe in a higher power you know it is just the law of gravity acting impersonally on a heavy object so within the principle of laws there is no good or bad so atheists have no right to ask the question why do bad things happen to good people because within atheism there is no rationale for a correlation that good things should happen to good people and bad things should happen to bad people but even atheists believe that that you know if i work hard i should get good results so this is a universal assumption now it's a valid question that sometimes we do good actions and don't get good results so this first point this is the first part i was going to talk about acronym do you anyone remember the acronym arm um, so i talked about a was what assumption so second r is reason now reason doesn't just uh, it means the faculty of reasoning so what do i mean by the faculty of reasoning over here so in general whenever something happens we we understand that 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 can have cause cause at various levels say for example right now if i am giving a class and sometimes when i am giving a class suddenly the audience starts looking at me as if they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles <laughs> <laughs> now when that starts happening then i had to think oh, what's happening you know is it that uh, maybe i am speaking something very complex maybe i am assuming the audience level is at a particular level which i am not which they are not or is it that the audience doesn't even understand the language in which i am speaking so basically whenever we encounter something unexpected so if i am speaking something reasonable say if if i if i make a joke and then nobody laughs then i think what's happening so there is a what happens see, we normally live in a world where we expect a certain level of order that or, order means what this cause a, a cause produces the ex expected result hmm? say right now i have the mic in front of me and when the mic is in front of me there should be the amplification of the sound so the whenever there is order then within the arena of order the 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 cause produces its exp expected effect now sometimes we experience chaos chaos is the arena where the cause does not produce the expected effect so if i am speaking right now and there is no amplification then i may think oh is this mic off so that's the first level explanation of mic is not off then i would say maybe is the sound system off or the sound system is not off then has the power itself gone off <coughs> or if i say i can extrapolate this further he says that you know that maybe the power grid in western australia has crashed and that's why power everywhere has gone off or maybe terrorists have attacked australia and all the power plants in australia have crashed down or maybe there is a solar flare that has come from the sun into the earth's atmosphere and when the solar if a solar flare comes into the earth's atmosphere all electrical and electronic objects devices on the earth will close down so you know the stability of the sound system the causal connection can be extended to the intensity of the sun rays coming from the sun millions of years millions of miles away so basically the reason means what that when the expected cause sorry the, when the cause does not produce the expected result when we experience chaos then we use our reasoning faculty to try to make sense of the disorder so the same event can be placed in different causal boxes 
So one causal box is I speak through the mic and you hear. Then that thing thing makes sense. But I'm speaking through the mic and not hearing. Then the I one causal box I could put the mic is off. Another bigger causal box is the power is off. Another bigger causal box is causal box means the cause and the effect. What is the what is the framework that contains that? That's the causal box. So basically, while working while functioning, we usually function with certain assumptions. But when things don't happen according to those assumptions, then we try to use our reason to try to find a bigger causal box. Say so right now, all of you are sitting in this class, and every one of you is reasonably confident that the person next to you is not going to turn you at you and slap you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you, know, you could say it's possible. <laughs> yeah, everything is possible, but it is not probable. Hmm? But suppose it happens. Say, what's wrong with you? you know, are you mad with me, or are you mad only? Isn't it? <laughs> so basically, we function with with a certain causal box, and when when things don't fit within that causal box. Then we try to find a new causal box. Now, why is this happening like this? And we we try to fit things. With, you could have bigger and bigger causal boxes within which we try to fit things. And usually, we try to find some causal box big enough in which we can fit the thing. So that is how we function in the world. We never function as if. Uh, things are just chaotic. Sometimes we may say that the, what is the causal box in which this will fit? I don't know. Okay. But still, that doesn't mean we lose faith in the principle of cause-effect correlation. So, a simple example for this could be: suppose we have some kind of swelling in our body, some kind of uh, discomfort, and we go to a doctor, and the doctor says, "The doctor says you got cancer." And the first question you would ask is, you know, when you say hearing the word cancer is scary, but then after we recover from the shock, we would ask, what caused it? Now many cancers, it's very difficult to know their cause. Some people say it's the environmental pollution. Some people say it's a modern lifestyle. This, that, the specific cause is very difficult to know. And it can seem extremely unfair, you know. Why should, why should I get a cancer like this? But then, the next question we'll ask it: Is it curable? Is it treatable? Now, what does it mean? When we ask, is it treatable? That means, although we are not able to find the causal box in which to put this, why did I get this cancer? Although I don't, I cannot find a causal box in which to put it. Still. I don't lose faith in the cause effect connection because when I'm asking is this cancer curable what it means is I'm still believing that if I take some medicine that cause will produce the effect of curing the disease so even if sometimes we can't find the cause effect box to put things in that the causal box to put things in still that doesn't mean we stop believing in cause effect we always believe in cause effect and maybe in few by future research will we'll, yeah, maybe scientists will find out okay you know this this particular behavior causes cancer that particular behavior causes cancer when in the history of europe there was the black plague now scientists found initially the well the word scientist itself came a little later at that time whatever those 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 people were called the word science scientist itself came in the 17th century more or less but those who were the you could say the ancestors of scientists <laughs> so they observed that wherever there was plague there were cats <coughs> so they thought cats caused the black plague and they decided to kill all the cats and what happened the plague increased all the more and then they realized what's wrong and they found actually maybe it's not the cats it's the rats that carry the plague germs and then they decided to go exterminate the rats and when they removed the rats the plague went down 
Now, what happens? Cats and rats normally are there at the same place. So, initially, they put it in the wrong causal box. Or the black plague is there, it's caused by cats. But when they found that that causal box doesn't work, then they put it in another causal box. So, the point is, when we can't find a particular causal box in which to fit something in, we try to search what causal box will things fit in. And that is the use of our reason. Our reasoning power is meant to be used to fit things in the right causal box. In fact, <clears throat> when people say get depression, what happens is often people under depression, people under depression, they put events in the worst possible causal boxes. What do you mean by worst possible causal box? I was in America and I was at a, at a conference in on mental health and spiritual. On and spirituality. So there's a girl who was telling about how she went into depression and how her spirituality helped her come out of depression. So she was telling that she was uh, studying in a college and to get some more money, by the way, she was waiting, she used to wait tables at a, a hotel. And while she was at the hotel, she wanted, uh, she was serving water to somebody. She was carrying a glass of water and suddenly the glass of water slipped from her head. And she started thinking, I am so worthless. I can't even carry a glass of water properly. What am I going to do with my life? How am I going to live my life? And just that action of a water, glass of water falling down put her into depression. Now, how many of us have had a glass of water slipping from our hands? <laughs> you know, it has happened with me when I was in the Vyasasana. It can be quite embarrassing at that time. <laughs> but now when that happens, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the water was slippery, maybe the glass was slippery, maybe our hands were wet, maybe we were just inattentive. How many of us have concluded that from the glass of water slipping from our hands, I am worthless <laughs> and my life is going to be worthless. So what has happened over here? This event, they have put it in the is the smallest negative event, they put it in the biggest causal box. So, the inability to place things in the right causal boxes can cause a lot of problems. So, depression happens when small effects, we put them in the wrong and very big causal box. So, people who are, people who are mentally disturbed, they don't, their, their intelligence is not sharp enough to put things in the right causal box. Say, if they meet someone and they greet someone and that person doesn't greet them back. And they think, you know, oh, this person doesn't care for me. This person hates me. Oh, everyone here hates me. Oh, people in general hate me. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. I'm all alone in this world. And what is the use of my life? Now, one snub may make somebody suicidal. So, here we need to use our... Now, somebody who is not carried away by their mind, they'll say, you know, maybe they were busy, maybe they were having something in their mind and they didn't notice you also. Don't take it so seriously. So the point I'm making is, we use our reason to fit things in the right causal box. Now what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is that when things don't make sense, at that time we need to expand the causal box. So when bad things happen to good people, what is actually happening? It is that we all as human beings know that many times there is a delay between cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Say for example, <laughs> if we put our hand in fire, then our hand will burn imme immediately. But if we go out in cold weather, we might not fall, feel cold immediately. But maybe after a few hours, we will be sneezing and coughing. If somebody starts smoking, they might feel okay, life's cool. But maybe 20 years down the line, they will say, I was a fool. <laughs> Why did I smoke like that? Now my lung is filled with holes. So, we, the principle is that we understand that sometimes there is a time lag between cause and effect. So, just like when we sow some seeds, if we sow grains, they might sow in, uh, they might fructify in 2-3 months. Sometimes if we sow mango tree, it might take 5-10 years to grow. Some trees may take 50-60 years also to give fruits. So, basically, in our day-to-day -day observation, we see that Cause effect correlation is there, but sometimes it is delayed. 
So what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is that this principle of cause effect connection, we need to expand it to before this life and beyond this life. So sometimes the things that we have done in our previous life, those are the causes and the effects we get in this life. And sometimes the causes, the actions that we are doing in this life, it may appear that we are not getting any reactions. But those reactions will come in a future life. So now, <coughs> we could put this as an equation of four Ds. Hmm? So there is duty plus destiny plus duration is equal to the desired result. Duty, that is what we are doing right now. Then destiny is the past karma that we have done that is stored as our destiny. And then there is duration. So duty plus destiny plus duration that leads to the desired result. Now, in this case, sometimes our duty part may be 99% and destiny might be 1%. Sometimes duty might be 1% and destiny might be 99%. But, so sometimes what happens? The remaining part, we don't even think about it. Just like when we eat food, we just eat food and we get energy. But you know, the, for us to get food, and eat food and get energy, first of all, we need to have a functional digestive system. If the digestive system is not functional, we might eat food, but we will not get energy. So if somebody's digestive system being functional is a part of destiny. Some people are very sickly, they, then they just can't digest food. So sometimes what will happen is, if the destiny is favorable, it might appear as I eat food and I get energy. So, the destiny and the duration might almost appear like invisible. They are there, but sometimes they can be invisible. Mm. So, <clears throat> say, I will give two examples for illustrating this. Sometimes, you know, some people, as I said, tend to be very sickly. You know, if even a little imbalance in their diet, then they become sick. Or say somebody has some, somebody is genetically uh, genetically predisposed towards obesity or somebody has some thyroid issue or whatever. They eat a little food and their body balloons out. Mm. And some people, they, they treat their tongue <coughs> like a conveyor belt. <laughs> conveyor belt. They keep putting anything and everything down the tongue. And still they remain perfectly healthy. And they don't even seem to become fat, they remain slim. So now what is going on over here? So that means now this person is eating food very carefully and still they are sickly. Now that means their careful eating is just a very tiny part. By destiny they already have a sickly body. So their careful eating is just 1%, the sickly body is 99%. And that's why even after careful eating they still remain sick. But somebody by destiny is meant to have a healthy body. And even if they are eating bad right now, because of that, because their most of their present situation is determined by destiny, so their unhealthy eating doesn't affect them right now. So the point which I'm making over here is that we need to expand with, with our reasoning power. We need to expand our the causal box in which we put things. When good things, when bad things happen to good people, all that it means is that it is not just their immediate action that is responsible <laughs> for that result. Our immediate action is only one thing that plays part. So imagine the three people are walking along a road and it's a like it's a rainy season. It's rainy season now. It's rained, so they don't notice that there is some kind of, that, that the ground in front of them is slippery, and all three of them slip. Now the first person slips, but you know there is a pole nearby. They catch hold of the pole and they steady themselves. The other person slips, and just nearby there's a puddle and they fall into the puddle. Nothing is hurt except their pride. Hmm? And a third person, they slip and they fall and just nearby there is a sharp jagged rock and their head falls on that rock and they get brain hemorrhage. And then coma for six weeks. Now you can say here, all three of them, they could say made the same small mistake of being inattentive while walking. But the three of them got very different results. So we could say by the first person, their destiny was favorable. So that's why a small mistake and just a small result. Okay, practically no result at all. 
for the second person is that is still little unfavorable so they got all their uh, children their clothes soiled and they got uh, they they maybe they they humi they felt humiliated by that but a third person got severely injured so basically the principle of karma can help us make sense when the immediate causal box doesn't make sense i did such a small mistake and why is this person so mad at me well it's not just because of this mistake you know maybe there is some past karma going on over there so the principle of karma helps us to expand the causal box in which to put things and that is what is very important so we need to use our reasoning power to recognize that at different times different causal boxes are appropriate and say suppose somebody eats on a cold night cold rainy night like this they go and eat 10 ice creams and next morning they wake up ice cream <laughs> 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 they have got a terrible throat they feel like screaming at that time in pain now now if their throat is thorough throat is terrible is that because of their past karma yes past nights karma <laughs> <laughs> yeah now if you can you can Im immediately put it in the causal causal box you know what why did we get the sore throat the immediate causal box is oh i ate so many ice cream last night but if i have not eaten anything then i have to see maybe is there some virus in this area i have got a virus so basically what happens our intelligence basically intelligence or reasoning power means to find the right causal box in which to put things put events so that's how we always function in life to the extent we become expert in placing things in the right causal boxes to that extent we can function effectively now sometimes some people are habitually irritable you know it it appears as if the whole world has permanently disappointed them <laughs> it's like a frown never leaves their face only so and some people are like that then if they frown at us also and we understand there's nothing about me over this isn't it if i put it about oh why is this person so upset with me if you take it personally that's not the right causal box to put it in we have to find out which causal box to put things in so that is the reasoning power so now for example in the bhagavad gita's context so now I, this was the what was the acronym i was using a uh, so a was assumption r was reason now i'll come to the last part m is motivation so what is the purpose of understanding this knowledge of karma it is so that we can have the proper motivation for doing things so now when arjuna was fighting the kurukshetra war and he was thinking bhishma is my grandfather how can i fight against him how can i kill him that's a that's definitely a valid concern but krishna expanded arjuna's vision arjuna's causal box is krishna told arjuna that it is not you who are killing bhishma bhishma is a kshatriya who is meant to kshatriya is one who is meant to protect those who are in trouble when draupadi was in trouble bhishma failed to protect her and because of that grievous wrong doing see wrong doing is not just the wrong that we do wrong doing is also the right that we don't do so when he did not stop draupadi from being dishonored that was such a grievous wrong that he deserves to be punished for that so don't think that you are going to cause the death of bhishma by his own karma he is meant to die and you will become an expert you will simply become an instrument in that so he helped arjuna to put his actions in the right causal box 
So putting it in the putting things in the right causal box can ensure that we are always motivated to move forwards. So there can be two distinct scenarios. After explaining that, I'll conclude this and we can have question answers. Say, <coughs> sometimes we have done our best. And even after doing our best, we have not got the result. So at that time, what happens is, we might just get depressed, disheartened. If you look at the history of, say, the literature on success and failure in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 20th century and 21st century, from the roughly from the 19th century mid onwards, now things started changing. In the past, people treated failure as an event in one's life. But ever since people started last maybe one century or so, and especially the last 50 years, people have started taking failure too personally. That means earlier failure was considered to be an event. Now Sometimes people are considered to be failures. You know, you, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you couldn't, you're a failure. Now, a, per, a person is never a failure. It, it, is, it is, failure is an event that comes in a person's life. And sometimes it may happen that if the destiny is unfavorable, that means by the past karma, a person is supposed to go through some difficulties at that time. Then, our present karma may not produce the desired results. Now when that happens, if I will look at ourselves, did I try my best? Now we can always say I could have done better. But in the situation, did I try my best? Oh yes, I did try my best. Okay, then if it didn't work, then this is ne it's just negative destiny. Let, let me move forward. Now, as long as that negative destiny is there, maybe I may not get the results of my karma. Well, results of the good that I am doing right now. But I don't have to take it too personally. I don't have to become disheartened about it. So, you know, when we have done our best and still the result does not come, if we put it in the causal box, oh, you know, I did my best and the results didn't come, therefore something is per permanently wrong with me. Sometimes we try to develop a relationship with someone and that person just doesn't reciprocate. That person turns and betrays us. Then, what did I do wrong? It's always good to check whether we did something wrong. But sometimes we might have done some minor wrong and that person has got terribly upset by that. Then we don't have to take that personally. Sometimes by our karma, we might be meant to get some adi daivik, adi bhautik klesh. And we will get some relational, relational issues. So, when we put it, <coughs> when we put the not getting results or getting unfavorable results in the causal box that, oh, I have done something wrong. Then what happens? I tried my best. And if my best is not good enough, then what is good enough? Then maybe I am myself never good enough. And that's how we sink into depression. But you will see in your life that sometimes you do your best and the results don't come. Have any of you had this experience? You did your best, but you didn't get the results. Isn't it? I think we all have that experience. Now, have any of you had the other experience also? You did some efforts, but you got a lot of results by that. Isn't it? Now we all, if we are honest, we will admit that. <laughs> so what happens is that, if you are not experiencing that, you will experience that also soon. That sometimes we do our best and still we get little results. And sometimes we do a little, but we get so much result by that. So it's like I say now the Cricket World Cup is going on. So you can take a cricket example. Sometimes the batsman is out, sometimes the batsman is not out and is declared out. This is so unfair. But if you look at the overall batsman's career, career, sometimes the batsman is out and is declared not out. So things even out in the long run. But so motivation means that if we are going through a dark phase in our life and things are not working out, then don't take failure too personally. It's not that we are ourselves doing something wrong because of which the failure is coming. Of course, we can introspect. Could I have done something better? We should learn from whatever we have done. But there's no need to think of ourselves as failures. Okay, I, I did this minor mistake. Let me try to avoid it in the next life. And that way, if we understand the principle of karma, what it essentially means is that our by our present actions, we can determine our future. 
Now, whether that future will be the future in half an hour or the future in two, uh, one day or the future in one month or the future in one year, that we may not know. But if we do our best right now, then we are creating a better future for ourselves. So sometimes up the, we do our best and we get the results imme immediately. But sometimes we may do our best and still the results may not come. But all the good that we are doing, it's not going waste. It's all accumulating as our positive destiny. And this positive destiny will manifest in due course. And ultimately, beyond destiny or controlling destiny is Krishna. Krishna is not destiny, Krishna is the lord of destiny. So for a devotee, you could say, I said, I said that there is duty, destiny, duration and there is a desired result. Now Krishna is above all of these. And if we turn towards Krishna and if we are devoted to Krishna, Krishna can empower us to do our duty better. So if our destiny is unfavorable, Krishna can empower us to tolerate that unfavorable destiny. Krishna can even transform that unfavorable destiny. If the duration which we have to go through is a long time, Krishna can give us inner strength to weather that duration. And Krishna can take us to the desired result. So Krishna is there in each walk of our life. Krishna is always with us. By Krishna's grace, whether destiny is favorable or unfavorable, Krishna is always favorable to us. And if we stay favorable to him, if we stay favorably connected to him, Krishna will take us to, through darkness to light. Now whatever karma may get us to, whether it is a present karma or past karma, sometimes it might, we might be put in a lot of difficulties. But whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. That is the conviction of a devotee and if you live with this conviction staying connected with krishna then a devotee doesn't worry too much about being karma conscious a devotee's primary focus is to be krishna conscious now in every situation you no know, oh i've done this karma or i've done this activity what will be the result of this activity a devotee is not so much worried about it a devotee's concern is how best can i serve krishna in this situation so sada hari Bhakti Thakur says, in happiness and distress, just chant the name of Krishna, just pray to <coughs> Krishna. Krishna, how can I serve you? And if we have this mood, then Krishna can empower us to face all kinds of situations. So how does Krishna work uh, to protect us and to guide us? You know, whatever is our destiny, the destiny will come, but Krishna will enable us to weather that destiny. So, uh, suppose there is a small, there is a child and who is supposed to have done homework but has not done the homework. So, because of that, now the teacher is very strict and the teacher is going to say that, you have not done your homework, I am going to punish you, show your hand and tuck, 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 the stick the teacher is going to beat. Now, the, now the, the, the mother doesn't want the child to be beaten. But at the same time, the mother doesn't want the child to be undisciplined and irresponsible. So what to do? So what the mother does is, the, while the child goes to school, the mother puts a nice thick glow on the child's hands. And the glow is in the child's hand, the child goes to school. Have you done your homework? No. Okay, come here. Show your hand. Here is the hand. And the stick comes. Tuck, tuck, tuck. The stick hits. And a loud noise comes. But because of the glow, there is no hurt. There is no, the child is not hurt. So we are like that child. We all have done something wrong. Krishna is like our mother. And destiny is like the teacher. So destiny is destiny is strict. Destiny is meant to give us the stick. But Krishna is merciful. So Krishna gives us that glove. That glove is remembrance of Krishna. It is Krishna consciousness. Now, If we are conscious of Krishna, even amidst difficulties, actually when difficulties are there, there is pain, 
But when you keep thinking about the difficulty, the problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Life determines our problems, but we determine their size. If you think about Krishna, then that pain is not that much. So Krishna consciousness is like the glow which enables us to protect ourselves from being hit and wounded. We'll be hit, but the blows of life may still hit, but they will not hurt. But if the child thinks, you know, why do I need this glow? And while going to school, the child takes out the glow and throws it away. And when the child reaches the school, then the stick will hurt terribly. So if we think, what is the use of this Krishna consciousness? I don't need it. I'm okay in my life. Then when the destiny will hit, it will hurt terribly. But if we hold on to Krishna, if we strive to be conscious of Krishna, then through good and through bad, Krishna will guide us, Krishna will empower us. Destiny uh, can hurt us in many different ways. The world can hurt us in many different ways. But greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. And when we turn toward Krishna and absorb ourselves in him, that he can protect us from all of life's, life's hurts, and ultimately take us beyond this hurtful life to his eternal abode. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of understanding karma, arming ourselves with the knowledge of karma to face life's challenges. This is a soldier is told, never drop your weapons. Similarly, we should never drop our arms. And our arm is spiritual knowledge that can help us to face life's blows. So I to explain this spiritual knowledge, I talked about an acronym. What was A? <coughs> Assumption. That we, in every walk of life, in our day-to-day -day life, we assume that if something has happened, what is the cause of that? We assume a cause of a connection. Even science works based on that assumption that things don't just happen by random. At random. There is a cause of a connection. So it's universal. So even atheists, they also accept a cause of a connection. So now, so the, this is common sense, but sometimes we can't see the cause of a connection. That is, people do good and still they get bad. Then R was? Reason. Reason, reason I meant that, you know, we need to place things in the right causal box. Now, if I speak and you are through a mic and I can't, you can't hear. Then the causal box of the mic acting as the amplifier is not working. Acting mic is meant to amplify the sound, not, sound is not working. <coughs> then is the mic not working? Is the power not working? Has the power grid collapsed? Have, has the sun got a flare? So we have to find the right causal box in which to put things. And that is where we use our reasoning faculty. When people get depressed, what happens is they take small events and they put them in the biggest causal boxes. And they take things very personally. So to, uh, to give us a bigger causal box in which to fit things, the Bhagavad Gita explains that we are souls on a multi-life journey. And just as we see in this life that cause and effect is not necessarily immediate. There are different time delays between say the food that we eat or the things that we say indulgence, smoke or whatever. The result may not come immediately. Sometimes it may take decades to come. So same principle, it extends to before this life and beyond this life. So when good people are getting bad things happening to them, what that means is their good actions, they are still going to produce the result. But their good actions alone are not the cause of what they are experiencing right now. There is a bigger causal box also. So to explain this bigger causal box, what are the four, four Ds? Does anyone remember? Duty, destiny, duration, that leads to desired result. So now sometimes what happens is, that if the destiny is favorable and the duration is negligible, then only these two appear to be in the causal box, duty and desired result. I eat and I get energy. But sometimes I eat and I just get pain in the stomach because of that. <coughs> so what has happened? Then by destiny at that time, I meant to have a sickly body at that time. So although sometimes within a sh just the duty and des desired result might come about, that doesn't mean the other factors are not there. So when this causal box doesn't make sense, we have to find out, is it that this causal box is working right now? So my effort might be just 1%, but if the destiny is 99% unfavorable, the results may not come at that time. So placing scriptural knowledge is meant to help us place things in the right causal box. And when we learn that, then we come to M. What is M? Motivation. We can always keep ourselves motivated and inspired 
if we can put things in the right causal box. Sometimes we have done the wrong and we need to fix things. Then at that point we take responsibility and fix things. Sometimes we have done our best, but still results have not come. Then there is no need to take failure personally. Failure is an event in a person's life. Failure is not a person. A person is never a failure. So we don't take failures so personally. I did my best and whatever good I have done, it is contributing to my future positive destiny. Even if the results are not going to come right now. We tolerate and then that dark phase of destiny will end in due course. And I talked about how Krishna can empower us to do our duty more effectively. Krishna can guard us from the negative effects of destiny or Krishna can remove that negative destiny also. And Krishna can give us the inner strength to tolerate through the, to wait through the duration that we have to go through. And thus, if we are with Krishna, then Krishna can create a bright future for us, no matter however dark our present seems to be. Greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. And Krishna helps us, protects us and heals us by giving us the glove of Krishna consciousness. So destiny is like that harsh teacher who might hit us, but if we have worn the glove, then, Krishna, then we will not be hurt by life's hurts. Life's blows may hit us, but they won't hurt us. Whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us through. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, please do. Guru, how does uh, like astronomy and Vastu fit into the picture? How does, ast how does astronomy and Vastu fit into the picture? There's a lot going on over here. Basically, astronomy <coughs> is like a weather forecast. <coughs> if I'm going to drive along the road, so how well I'm able to drive and whether I'm able to reach the destination or not, that depends not just on my driving skills or how good my car is. It also depends on, it also depends on how, uh, how good the road is. So if the road is unfavorable, then even if I'm driving cautiously, still I might meet <coughs> an accident. So destiny is like a weather forecast. It tells us what kind of events we are going to experience in our life. So it's not that astrology necessarily, it, astrology doesn't determine the events. Astrology doesn't, uh, our <coughs> astrology tells us what kind of events we will encounter in our life journey. But our actions, our responses to those events, our preparation to those, those events is still in our hands. Similarly, Vastu can tell us that, okay, in particular geographical settings or particular architectural settings, certain things may be favorable or unfavorable for us. So we can see Vastu or astrology as an additional resource for our decision making. We should never use these to outsource the responsibility for decision making to someone else. Okay, my astrologer said this, so I'll do it. My astrologer said I won't, don't do it, so I won't do it. No, it is, we have to take responsibility. Just like if we may have to, uh, somewhere, some driving somewhere may be very important for us. And even the weather forecast is very bad, we might still say, I have to go. But then, once you know the weather forecast, we may can go very carefully. So sometimes astrology may tell us, you know, this is an unfavorable phase for you. But if you are determined to do something, then you may do it, but we do it very cautiously. And sometimes even the astrology weather forecast says, this road is very clear for you. But sometimes if the driver is careless, even on a clear road, there can be an accident. So similarly, astrology is no guarantor. Even if somebody says astrology, everything is favorable. Uh, still, there is no guarantee that things will work out right. So we have to just see astrology as another resource, which those of us who have faith in astrology can use that resource. But we shouldn't outsource the decision making responsibility to the astrologer. Okay, thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Hmm. Okay. So, if some relatives are going through some difficulties, we understand that it is because of their past karma. So, how do we avoid getting hard-hearted because of that? Actually, 
you know, more important than what is whose karma is what is our dharma because our dharma is our duty what is the responsible way for me to act in the situation we are not meant to judge people according to their past karma imagine if a thief robs somebody a some citizen and the citizen goes to the king and the citizen says i have been robbed and the king says it was your karma <laughs> then what are you doing sitting on the throne no it is your dharma to protect the king now if despite the king's effort the thief is not caught then you could say it was your karma and you uh, uh, you lost this but it is also a failure of the law law and order system over there right so we while interacting with people we should focus primarily on this life's cause effect correlation otherwise as you rightly said we can become horribly hard hearted <clears throat> imagine there's a newborn infant and an infant is crying and the mother rushes to caress and comfort the infant if the mother thinks this infant is crying because of his past life karma <laughs> let him cry that would be horrible isn't it so our focus should not be on what is whose karma our focus should be on what is my dharma so what is the responsible for for me to act in the situation now sometimes just being there for people when they are in distress is the way we can help them sometimes giving them knowledge of karma can help them but we shouldn't see that as simply an opportunity or we shouldn't be there simply to it it shouldn't appear to people that we are using that situation to thrust our ideology around them we should be there to help them so again at that point when we are there with someone who is in distress our focus should be that you know what is the cause ill box in which i my words my actions can help this person in the best possible way so when abhimanyu is killed now arjuna is first he is shattered then he is infuriated and first his anger goes towards his brother he says all these weapons that you are carrying are they simply ornaments could not one of you protect my son and then he turns towards krishna and he is saying krishna you should have known why didn't you tell me and then now at that time krishna does not give any philosophy to arjuna krishna says o oh arjuna please don't please don't speak such harsh words can't you see your brothers are in as much distress as you are they loved abhimanyu as much as you loved them loved him please don't increase their distress by these harsh words says ordinary people break down and lash out in distress but great people try to relieve others of their distress so he spoke wisdom that was appropriate for the occasion when somebody is in distress there are very few if any occasions i have seen in scripture when somebody else goes and tells it is your karma when draupadi is dishonored nobody tells us it was tells her it was your karma because of which you are dishonored everybody treats it as a serious breakdown of the principles of dharma that nobody came forward to protect her when sita was abducted nobody says see it was sita's karma that she was abducted no so in, so we have to see from this life's perspective this is a terrible thing that has happened now there there see we might be able to see that big causal box but they are not seeing that bigger causal box so from this this life's causal box it is unfair and we accept that so we have to see but at this point is it that expanding their vision to help them see, to see the bigger causal box will that help them to gain acceptance of the situation or is it that we just sometimes that's not what people want people just want some kind words some em- empathy and is that going to help them so we have to see how we can best help people so if from this life's perspective something is wrong then we do acknowledge it is wrong this life's perspective may not be the complete perspective but that doesn't mean it is a it is and completely it is a it is a insignificant or a incorrect perspective it is also a valid but not complete perspective and 
अहो अहो वॉट इज भीष्मा टेल दट पांडव यू नो अहो अन्याय अहो कष्टम वॉट अ टेरिबल अट्रॉसिटी इज दट हैपन दैट यू हैव टू सफर ऑल दो यू हैव दो फॉल्ट ऑफ योर्स सो ही इज नॉट सेंग ओ यू मस्ट डन सम कर्मा बिकॉज ऑफ विच इट हैपन इट इज नो इट इज इट इज अट्रॉसिटी सो इफ इफ आवर फिलोसॉफी स्टार्ट मेकिंग एज हार्ड हार्टेड एंड वी आर डिफीटिंग द पर्पज ऑफ फिलोसॉफी Philosophy is not make, is meant to make us hard-hearted. Philosophy is meant is to make us cool-headed. Cool-headed means we don't get carried away by sentiments. There is a difference between cool-headed and hard-hearted. Hard-hearted is a person who has no feelings. Cool-headed is a person whose feelings don't carry the person away. Not that they don't have any feelings, but they don't let the feelings control their life. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Um. You said that the strongest argument, or one of the strongest arguments atheists have against God is the problem of evil. And then in the very next breath, you asserted that they have no right to assert that. Can you explain that? Because to me, that made no sense in the very first sentence. Okay. So when I said atheists don't have any right to make that argument of the problem of evil, see, <coughs> first of all, the category of good or evil this is a moral category and in a universe that is purely materialistic mora the existence of morality itself is a is an anomaly see science is not moral science is not immoral it is a moral it doesn't have a moral dimension at all and if you consider like, i give the example of a of a coconut falling on the tree the coconut is a moral it is just a object and is falling because of gravity so with so even richard dawkins has said that nature nature is pitiless in nature when is when evolution occurs there is no good there is no bad it is just unfeelingly pitilessly advancing so the moral categories of good and bad they themselves don't have any intrinsic place within the atheistic world view so of course as human beings we do understand that there is good and bad so somebody raising the objection that why do bad things happen to good people that's a perfectly valid objection to ask but to use that objection to foist atheism on someone atheism itself doesn't have an, any foundation for the category of good and bad good and evil and atheism itself does not have any explanation for why cause effect should be correlated so that's why i said that atheists don't have a right to that argument it's not that it's not a reasonable argument it is just that the word atheistic world view doesn't have any basis for that okay thank you hari krishna any other questions yes ma'am Okay, it's a very yeah. If somebody, everybody has something that takes them away from Krishna. So if somebody has a eating addiction, now, but eating is also essential. This is a complex question. That can we be destined to go away from Krishna? That means, can by destiny, by factors beyond our control, we be be put in situations that drag us away from Krishna? well we always have free will mm. and now let's consider some examples of somebody who went away from krishna mm. say ajamil was living a very virtuous life and that day when he went out he was also going on a virtuous mission he went out to get firewood for his fire father jagya and while he was going there he saw a very sexually agitating scene now we could say he could have gone anywhere in the forest to uh, to collect wood but that day he went to a place where this man and woman were doing obscene activities so we could say that was by destiny so by destiny he was subject to that provoking situation and now at that time scripture also says he tried to remember scripture he tried to try to remember scriptural wisdom but the arrow of cupid had entered deep into his heart 
and he came back, but still he just couldn't shake off that memory. And that memory just kept dragging him. And then what happened? He got so infatuated that he tried to get that prostitute and he rejected his wife, he rejected his parents, and he rejected his Brahminical duties, and he became a criminal. Because he had to earn a living some way. He couldn't live in an honorable way. So now here, what was destiny? His being subjected to that provoking situation was destiny. But after that, all the decisions that he took, now he was living in a Brahminical society, and if somebody just uh, abandons one's wife, uh, somebody kicks out one's parents, obviously there will be society around and people will disapprove that, people will warn you, don't do that. His not listening to all of that, that was not destiny. So destiny may subject us to provoking situations, but when we get provoked, we might even get provoked because of those provoking situations. But how much we act on that provocation? Every society and every culture has some checks. But when we reject those checks, when we sweep aside those checks, then we are responsible for that. So destiny can provoke us, but when we cross ethical boundaries, we are responsible for that. So now, how does that apply in today's world? We could say that uh, there are two things. There is to fall down and there is to fall away. Mm. So destiny may cause us to fall down, but it cannot cause us to fall away. To fall down means that there is a particular temptation that comes in our life and that temptation causes us to break some principle or to do something which we are not meant to do. That is fall down. Mm. That means we are living an upright life and we fall down. But to fall away means to give up the practice of bhakti itself. Say, oh, this bhakti doesn't work. I was practicing for so long, but still such a terrible thing happened to me. I'll never practice. I'll just give up the practice of bhakti. So if we decide to do that, then that is not destiny. That is our decision. So destiny might put us in a provoking situation and we might fall down. But when we decide to use that fall down as a justification for falling away, Fall down is an inability to follow one particular principle of bhakti. Fall away is to give up the entire practice of bhakti itself. So the two are very different. And that's why the Bhagavad Gita says that api chet sudurachara bhajate mamananya bhak sadhureva samantavya samyag vipasito hisa. That it says that even if somebody does an extremely wrong activity, if that person still stays devoted to me, then you should consider that person to be a good person, to be a devotee, to be a sadhu. Now, why is that? We might say that if they are, they are so strongly devoted to me, to, to Krishna, then how can they do a terrible thing? But that can happen by destiny. Sometimes even the best of people can get tempted. And we don't know what weak moment who is in. And sometimes the temptation catches somebody in a weak moment. They might do something which they would normally never have done. But if they still stay determined to practice bhakti, Krishna, I am sorry I didn't want to do this, but I ended up doing this. I am profoundly apologetic. I repent it, but I want to continue to serve you. So if they maintain that intention to serve Krishna, then they, they, their destiny won't <coughs> cause them to fall away. So that's why destiny may cause us to go away, but it doesn't destiny doesn't cause us to stay away. Say for example, if somebody has eating addiction, all of us can have different kind of addictions. So the, during that time, we just get blinded, we can't think of anything, I have to eat right now. But it's not that any kind of craving that we have, it's not there for 24 hours. It, we can say we all have urges and those urges have surges. Sometimes the urge just zooms up. At that time, we just can't resist it. But the surges don't last 24 hours a day. So if we consider one surge comes, after that there is some normal time. And then maybe the next surge will come. So what do we do in between those surges of the urges? So even if we can't resist our urges, we can persist between our urges. When that happens, I just can't do anything. I don't want to do this, but still I end up doing it. But what do I do in between? If in between, I am again determinedly connecting with Krishna and I am practicing bhakti sincerely, then gradually by that practice of bhakti, I will become strong enough so that when the urges rise, 
I'll be able to resist those urges also. So that's why there's a difference we, when we see and think of Krishna consciousness. It's a matter of consciousness. It's not just a matter of following some standards. See, somebody might follow a standard and they may become so proud that they are not conscious of Krishna. And somebody might fail to follow a standard and that might create humility within them and they may be more conscious of Krishna. I often give this example that say, say Kadashi and somebody fast Nirjalo Nikadashi and then they go to kitch the kitchen and see who all are eating what. <laughs> and they think this is so attached, sense gratifier, hopeless. So their body is fa fasting but their ego is feasting. <laughs> and although they are far doing Nirjal Ekadashi, they are not conscious of Krishna. They are only conscious of their own ego and their own greatness. On the other hand, somebody can't fast. Maybe they have a pitta body, which just gets too much acidity because of fasting, and they have to take two, three meals in a day. But they are humble and they say, Krishna, I am so fallen. Please give me your shelter. And they chant and pray sincerely. So they will be conscious of Krishna. So, of course, we have to follow the standards as much as we can. It's not that standards are just to be cast away. But Krishna consciousness is not just a matter of following rules. Krishna consciousness is a, Krishna consciousness is a matter of being conscious of Krishna. So sometimes we think that if this is a standard, and this is success on the standard, this is failure on the standard. And if I have success, then I am Krishna conscious. And if I have failure, I don't have any Krishna consciousness. That is normal, but that is not the only way things are. So Krishna consciousness includes failure and success both. I can succeed and be Krishna conscious, I can fail and still be Krishna conscious. That's why if we can't succeed in Krishna consciousness, then we can fail in Krishna consciousness, not fail out of Krishna consciousness. I once gave a class on how to fail well. <laughs> so how to fail well. So fail well, don't say farewell. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, shall we stop here? So, thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Mithai Gaur Premanande. Shila Prabhupada ki, Jai.